This film is a presentation of the New England Ski Museum. In the village of Jericho, Vermont, lived a man who, it was said, pursued snow with the ardor of a lover. Pursued it so well, he became known as Snowflake Bentley. In the image of each captured crystal, he came to know the perfect beauty of snow crystal after crystal, no two alike. Imagine a universe of snow and sky and no two alike. Now the plowman may see snow as something to push out of the way, and the motorist may just see all the pushing. But this film is about people like Snowflake Bentley, like children on sleds and skis who could see in snow whole worlds of dreams and adventures. I just remember just huge snowfalls and uh, as a kid um, you just were out all day long and I had you know my super flex flyer sled and I just would just wear myself out. This, this shot here that shows our house before all the trees have grown up you see and there we were coming down we, we were fortunate to have this hill and there we had our sleds we had flexible flyers we used to go down into the field. Oh, we had wonderful, wonderful time. I lived in a neighborhood, and behind our house we had a hill. It was called Dead Man's Hill, and it came off of Frog Mountain. And so after school, the, all the kids gathered at Dead Man's Hill, and we would get wet and frozen and get into this space in the snow. And the outside world would fade away, totally. And there was just you and the snow and your friends and this hill. And then somewhere in all of a sudden, way on the fringe of reality, you'd hear someone's mom. Dickie, dinner, dinner. And it would pull you back away from this space. And then <clears throat> we, we'd come in and our house would just be full of, of wet clothes drying. And of course, there weren't any clothes dryers or anything in those days. I always remember the smell of the house in winter because our, our clothes would be put around the balustrade upstairs and hung there to dry in the house. I used to go to this sledding hill when I was a kid and I thought it was huge and I went back there you know about a year ago and the thing was just tiny. But uh, snowboarding in many ways has its roots in sledding. I mean the first snowboard was a snurfer sort of in the modern age and uh, I think a lot of the snowboards that exist now were the thought was sort of set in people's minds such as mine having had the experience of riding a snurfer, which was more or less a, just a stand-up version of a sled. It's definitely magic. You know, a wave is, is pretty tough to beat, and you know, water's cool, but snow has got a tremendous amount of character to it, and it's such a great medium to ride. So the dawn of the 20th century may be the age of the snowboard and extreme skiing. But in the beginning, it was just a little hill and a sled. In their imagination, maybe they're not on a little hill, but on a big run at Lake Placid, where in the 1932 Olympics, the American team captured the attention of the country with a gold medal performance. 
or perhaps it was the uniform that captured their attention. In fact, a lot of early winter sports took place on ice and tended to involve a lot of speed. The small town version of the Olympics was Winter Carnival, complete with a semblance of an Olympic style parade down Main Street. The idea was to defeat Old Man Winter by getting out and embracing him through winter sport. Winter sport being rather broadly defined. There was speed skating, figure skating, dog sled racing, though these particular dogs seem to have their own ideas. There were cross-country races, and there were the boys from Brattleboro, jumpers all. Now that was the glamour event. Alpine skiing had little of the glamour it soon acquired. For most skiers, skiing really wasn't all that different than sledding. Sure, it took a little more balance, but both were pretty much straight ahead affairs. Point them down the hill and see what happens. For this lad, the difference is purely academic. The problem was, most people hadn't learned how to turn skis. The early skis were essentially wooden planks with curved tips. Only the most expert skier could make them do anything creative. And the experts were in the Alps, not New England. You could still have a lot of fun with skis. You could hook yourself to a dog. Immediately, one thinks of the greater thrill that might be had behind a stronger, fleeter animal. And then, someone comes up with an even brighter idea. The impulses that led to extreme skiing have apparently always been with us. A perfect day for flying. I just love, love winter, that was all. And I've had a, a, a lot of wonderful fun up in the White Mountains, starting way the way the hell back in 1921 when I first climbed Mount Washington through Tuckerman Ravine. We were great friends of Joe Dodge in the old days, and that was when, when all the headwall stuff started and everything. It was Brad Washburn who filmed this early Mount Washington expedition. The mountain had become accessible to skiers and snowshoers in 1926 when the legendary Joe Dodge, here greeting Washburn's party, offered to keep the cabin at Pinkham Notch open through the winter. So they took him up on it and uh, he threw the key away and said, well, I'll never close the door. And as long as he was there, the door was never closed. So he created the Appalachian Mountain Club hut system. He was no more as the mayor of Porky Gulch than uh, anything else. And the, reason for the name Porky Gulch was that in the early days there were more porcupines than uh, anything else around there. Watch Charlie Proctor, 1928 Olympian and Dartmouth's first star skier as he hitches up. 
the Amstut spring would retain the heel on the ski and still allow it to lift as the skier climbed. Skiing was still very much an uphill sport. To ski Mount Washington had always demanded two things, that willingness to climb and good judgment. In 1934, the world's record wind was recorded here at 231 miles per hour. If you want to test equipment that you're going to use on Everest, the place to test it is, is the last quarter mile of the auto road in January on Mount Washington. Anything that'll stand there will go anywhere on Everest. Charlie Proctor was the first to ever ski the head wall at Tuckerman's Ravine. Here, he takes a run in 1932. Others would take their adventure on a homemade jump on that backyard hill. The first rule of jumping, keep your tips up. Now we'll try that again with the usually predictable result but crash and burn seems to be an almost integral part of the sport. It's a testament to the lure of skiing that so many people could fall so many times and continue walking back up the hill. A cheap thrill, maybe, but air has always been biggest in your own mind. This backyard gathering knows their heroes. Here was a sport whose zip and daring captured the imagination of sports-minded Americans. Organized jumping had started at the end of the 19th century and was a well-attended spectacle by the 1920s. Here were the extreme skiers of the day who did their own share of crashing and burning. towns had little ski jumps and it was the thing to do. This was long before alpine skiing was even known. My home was in Hanover and we of course had several ski jumps there in Hanover but you could jump 50 feet but that's where little kids learned to jump. And then as time went by and we got into our early teens we began to look up to the bigger jump, Dartmouth ski jump. So we did a lot of tramping snow and looking up enviously at the, at the trestle, but never going up. We'd ride the landing hill, and after a while, eventually, it came to be our turn to try it. I remember we sort of had a pact among us that if we carried our skis up, we were not going to carry them down. There are those who've gone up with the intention of jumping and not jumping, but carrying them down. But to my memory, nobody carried them back down. <laughs> Time passes, and the hill returns to forest. Where thousands gathered stands only a crumbling tower of steel and wood, silent witness to men flying on skis. But perhaps the same spirit can be found today in the halfpipe, the cliffs of the backcountry, or the freestyle aerial. If there is any doubt that this could be the same spirit, Check this out. The only jump that I can think of left in Vermont is Brattleboro. Too bad, it was a great sport. I thought it was about the safest sport going because all you did was just go straight ahead, the hills all to yourself. 
Either you made it or you didn't. So, <laughs> and it was a thrill. What turned alpine skiing from a hike or romp in the snow to a fashionable sport in less than a decade was the fact that it became just a little less thrilling as skiers learn to avoid the trees not by falling, but by making controlled turns. In order to make alpine skiing popular, it turned out, you needed skiers from the Alps. By the early 30s, in the mountains of Europe, everything that we recognize as the modern ski resort was already in place. These fellas knew how to ski. The shadow of war looming over Europe hastened the arrival of Swiss, German, and Austrian ski instructors. In peaceful America, Mr. Schneider found crossed ski poles and not bayonets the order of the day. For Hanna Schneider, a new beginning in a new setting. The Europeans spread the gospel of alpine ski technique and lent an air of continental sophistication to the somewhat less refined New England ski scene. But it was a Yankee contraption in the form of the rope toe that really brought alpine skiing into New England village life. I started skiing when I was four or five years old, and, and all I had to do was go across the bridge and a quarter of a mile away, we had a you know, the rope tow, a local rope tow, and there were a lot of towns with little local rope tows. The first rope tow was built in Woodstock, Vermont, and the town soon boasted a dozen. But the ski tows began popping up like popcorn, you know. There was a, a swamp tow, and then there was a baby tow that took you, you didn't have to walk anywhere took you from the swamp toe up to the house, and from the house you could go up to the back of the hill and go to six and go down. And you could just keep on going round and round and round as long as you could stand it. <laughs> but it was great fun. I used to figure out how much it cost to operate the lift, the cost of the rope, the cost of the fuel, and depreciation of equipment and so on. It was like 50 cents an hour or something like that. Not including the operator's time. The rope is a pretty inexpensive item. People would be struggling, their arms would be slipping and swearing. <laughs> you fell under it, you know, it'd run across your leg or your arm, and your, of course, your one whole side of your your clothes were all worn out, and your mittens were all tattered, and you had we had leather patches sewn under our under our arms of our ski uh, parkers just because they'd get worn out from trying to grab on. I mean, it was an old Ford motor and, and this rope that was weighed 400 pounds when it got really wet. We'd always have a, an adult go up ahead of us because we couldn't hold it up. Um, but that's how we, uh, that's how all of us learned to ski in, in, in the old days. It was as much of a thrill going up as coming down because they still had the transmission from the Model A with a, with a, just like a truck shift, first gear, second gear, third gear. What if they put it in third gear and go a million miles an hour going uphill? You can do a tremendous amount of skiing, but they've got a bad name now. You know, every, <laughs> all the hot shots, uh, or oh, rope, <laughs> geez, you know, they don't want any part of a rope. As soon as the toe was invented, we no longer needed a free heel to climb. So for more, con more control of the heavy wooden skis they had, they hooked the heel down. Now they could hold the rope toe. Skiing changed into a fall line endeavor. You go up with the lift and you come back down. So Alpine went the way it went with, Alp with, with the lockdown heel. Nordic took off in the other direction and skiing split into Nordic and Alpine. Nordic skiing, jumping, and cross country survived primarily in the schools, where most coaches believed that true skiers skied for events. They had to jump, they had to uh, downhill, slalom, and cross country, and uh, most people didn't think they liked cross country as much as the other more glamorous sports, but that was the only way you could get on the, on the ski team, so everybody did it.
In this 1939 film promoting North Conway, New Hampshire, the skiing and mountains bear a striking resemblance to the Alps. Skiing. No sport in the United States ever made such tremendous strides in popularity. No sport affords the participant more spine-tingling thrills. The sharp wind whistling past your ears, the fresh snow tattooing your face, the pristine beauty of mountain slopes flashing by, swift descent on mercury-tipped hickory boards. That's skiing. Anna Schneider, the Austrian who more than anyone else had invented modern ski technique, had said that speed and not touring was the lure. And he had been right. I like going fast. I loved chasing the canyon. I just thought that was a lot of fun and, and hoping it would work out at the bottom where it got very narrow, <laughs> and it did. I like to go fast. It's like massaging the hill, and which then is a massage of the body, I think. It, um, it feels very, um, it feels like, uh, like some sort of flight. Here is the ski lark defined. You would fly down and be carried back up. Witness the ski mobile, boon to the ski enthusiasts who flock to North Conway, up the side of Cranmore Mountain, a ride of over a mile. And witness the single chair, the longest chair, the double chair, the T-bar, the shovel handle. In a slightly more European frame of mind, New Hampshire built the tramway at Cannon Mountain. There were mountaintop restaurants and ski trains. The beginning of a healthful excursion, and the novelty of the holiday is just what the doctor ordered for city cliff dwellers who crave a definite change. All the whatnots especially designed for skiing are part of a new sports market, increasing by leaps and bounds. My lady demands style even in ski togs, and Dame Fashion has outdone herself to provide costumes that will attract the eye of the most bashful snowman. Yeah, this is the Swiss orchestra that was selected as the best orchestra in Switzerland for the World's Fair. And now they're up here at the Eastern Slope Inn for us to entertain us while we ski here to nice powder snow. And no matter how well you skied that powder, the background music for a couple of generations would be... Let her go, Charlie. Tyrolean. <laughs> One of the driving forces behind the development of Cannon Mountain was Alec Bright, a founding member of Boston's Hockaburger Ski Club. I met him at the Olympics. He was on the men's team. We were training and I came down and my hands were absolutely frozen and I just said at the bottom to nobody in general, oh, my hands are so cold. And he said, well, in the States, we just shake them like this and I thought, you could have at least robbed them if you'd come over here and gotten me warm. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> he was, I think, without any doubt, the best Harvard skier who ever lived. But he also drove at an unbelievable rate going up to ski. I think he must have gone every weekend. And he always seemed to exceed the speed limit and was always stopped by the same policeman. 
finally, after being arrested, I don't know how many times, New Hampshire said, if, if you are ever arrested here again, we are not going to allow you ever to drive in New Hampshire. After the war, the first time he went up skiing, he was stopped by this same policeman. He thought, my heavens, what have I done now? I was not speeding. And it, the policeman came up and he said, Major Bright, we're glad you came back. <laughs> local hero was the guy that had been in, um, in the Second War and had the white skis and the white uniform. He was in the, in the 10th Mountain Division. And uh, he came back and with all this equipment and, and uh, it was on his, his parents' land that the, uh, the rope tow was put up. You know? All of the people who came out of uh, World War II and uh, particularly the 10th Mountain troops who had such a, an important uh, role to play in the development of skiing they all knew each other, and uh, all of the young guys like me looked up to those guys. Wish we'd been in the tenth mountain, and it was like a new it was it was like a new sport, and it was a tremendous amount of enthusiasm, and uh, and great experimentation. That was the era of all the ski movies, as a, for instance, and going to the ski movies in the fall with the Warren Millers and the John Jays and was a was a great experience, and everybody looked forward to it. The now Stein Erikson of Norway takes to the course. Six foot two, 180 pounds. Stein is the exception to the rule that Norway is just a land of yomping and cross country, for Stein is excellent at downhill and slalom. It was just fun. It was, uh, it was growing, it was fun, it was, uh, it was very vital. With the storytellers spreading the gospel and the returning veterans casting about for ways to make a living from their passion, the foundation was being laid for a skiing boom. The first new post-war ski area in Vermont was Mad River Glen. Construction began in 1947. The idea of Roland Palmetto, the only man to fly combat in both world wars, and the man largely responsible for the first chairlift at Stowe. His search for a place to build a new area on private land led into General Start Mountain in Waitsfield Valley. Like many early skiers, his passion for skiing grew out of love for the mountains. Many of the new trails had been marked by Palmetto himself. We heard about uh, Mad River was going to be built, and I thought, well, gee, that might be a great place to open up a lodge. So I took my mother with me, and we drove down on the, into the valley and on the Route 17, and we saw these two buildings in a silo and a barn in terrible shape. And uh, I said to mother, gee, that looks like a good location for a ski lodge right there. Like many a 10th Mountain veteran, Sewell Williams was looking for a way to turn his love of skiing into a livelihood. We picked it up pretty cheap. Of course, we put a lot of money into it. And so that became Ula Lodge, ULLA Lodge. I think it was 47 and 48 that uh, they had too much snow so they couldn't open. 48 and 49, we didn't have enough snow to open until February. And then if you saw the movies, you'd see rocks here and there. And it, it was pretty rocky on that opening day. And we went up the lift, but I don't think anybody skied down. I don't think there really was enough snow to ski down around all the rocks. And then we had four bad years, four bad seasons in a row, and they didn't make snow in those days. And most of your lodges on the Mad River Road went bankrupt or were for sale. After a while, I was advertising in the Yale Record, maybe the Harvard Lampoon, and all these different colleges. Uh, uh, I'd say, uh, snow or no snow, the place to go, house party atmosphere. So some guys would come up without skis. They didn't care. They're just coming up to have a good time. So we had Yale, Dartmouth, Harvard, Princeton, Cornell, Smith, uh, Vassa, uh, Skidmore, you, you name it. And uh, some of these colleges would call up and say, what girls' college is coming up this weekend, <laughs> for the weekend? <laughs> we want to know whether to come up or not. Well, I'm sure there were a lot of others who uh, embarked on crazy stunts, but not I. I was pretty serious. Up at the stop, rookie dodge. 
Getting ready to go for the USA. Tremendous heave in the poles, and he was off. Student up at Dartmouth College. Brookie is the son of Joe Dodge, who keeps the Appalachian huts at Mount Washington, New Hampshire. In the post-war period, competitive skiing meant Eastern collegiate skiing. Excellent time to place ninth for the USA, the highest we were to do in this particular event. In 1954, there were only five men on the team. And initially, all five of those were Easterners. But I'm convinced the reason they were all Eastern is because there was such tight competition in the East. And we had a tendency to ski on worse conditions of rocks, ice, ruts, everything. In fact, in 1956, most of the men on my Alpine ski team in the Olympics in Cortina, Italy, were from the East, Dartmouth and Middlebury. You didn't need to train all year long, you didn't need to practice all year long, and you didn't need to be as uh, totally uh, one-sided as you, as you have to be today. It's very, very hard to go to college today and, and uh, be good enough to make the uh, U.S. team. We could do it then. It was much looser, and the, the teams would get together and we'd sing songs, old war songs, and 10th Mountain songs, and uh, a lot of the Canadians, you know, the McGill people were just they were wild and they had all kinds of songs going and uh, we just had a great time. It was like a big family. I love the team skiing aspects uh, of college ski racing. Uh, that meant a lot to me and I really enjoyed it. And uh, the carnivals took, took place typically on uh, Fridays and Saturdays and then we'd go into open competition on uh, Sunday. And uh, the winter was chuck a block full of competition. Yeah, carnivals were important. We won all the carnivals, it was 53 at three carnivals, Dartmouth, Middlebury, and McGill. So that meant nine possible first places in those nine events, and I won eight that year. I was second in a downhill at Middlebury. Vern Goodwin beat me in the downhill. The ski team used to get great write-ups in the New York Times and so forth. Nowadays, uh, New York Times doesn't even know there's any snow, I think. <laughs> but the skier who made the biggest headlines hadn't even been to college. 19-year-old Andy Mead Lawrence. At the 1952 Olympics in Norway, she was expected to do well. But on the downhill, she fell and placed 18th. Now, the giant slalom, where ski film pioneer John Jay takes up the story. Andy literally poured on the coal as she streaked down the course. She's been skiing since she was three, competing since she was 10. And that was it, winning time. Andy made a big hit, modest and likable. The second gold medal in the history of American skiing. Idaho's Gretchen Frazier had won in the slalom of 1948. And it looked like just one for Andrea Mead Lawrence, who was fourth after a fall in the first run of the slalom. Imogene Opton, USA, watched and said, I've never seen Andy so quiet. And when the leader, O.C. Reichert, skied her second run, she bettered her time by six-tenths of a second. 5.4. Darn, said Reddish. That does it. That gives her the race. And it certainly looked that way. But something about her expression told us that win or lose, Andy was going to go all out on this run. And that's just what she did as she started out now, racing the clock down the mountain. Andy went to work. Andy had her teeth clenched as the coach, Emmy Lale, watched her skis began to get faster and faster. She took the steep spot now where many another had fallen, took it beautifully, still skiing fast, definitely won for the books, win or lose. Andy was flying through the gates, not a mistake yet, and we looked at the time, 103.4. She had done it and won the race. That was skiing back in those days. If you fell, you could get up and still finish the race and win it. Nowadays, you fall, you're through. You're just out of it, which is, shows you what kind of skiing we were doing at that time. Not very good.
I mean, just to ski on some of the trails, you had to be an extreme skier because, you know, we didn't have them rolled, you know, absolutely like a, a, a carpet the way they are now. Here in the Northeast, uh, uh, we, we packed out the trail to the top, and then we'd ski it. Of course, no control gates. The control gates were the trees. And I can remember being at the top of the race course and listening to the crackling of the radio. And uh, there was always somebody who had an orange, and that would be our snack before we'd start. And many times the radio would conk out, and we'd have to wait for 15 or 20 minutes, freezing to death. So although that's not extreme skiing, it certainly is much tougher than what people ski today on a, on a general basis. It was a different type of skiing. It's the old Alberg technique, and uh, our equipment wasn't very good, and boots weren't very good. And, big floppy pants and so forth. If you saw the movie on the other side of the mountain about Jill Kimmott, who was paralyzed in 55, um, y you'll, you'll see people skiing the old-fashioned way. And this isn't such an old movie. Uh, and I asked someone how they got these skiers to ski that way, and he said it was easy. We just gave them the old equipment. So uh, equipment makes a big difference. And then, of course, we went to, there was Mr. Marker in 1956 at the Olympics. He came to all of us and asked us if we would try his, his marker toe piece. And we said, what? Have the, the ski come off when we're skiing? Absolutely not. We'd rather break our legs. The women's downhill might have been an everyday race except for airplane corner, a vicious 90-degree turn just 15 seconds from the finish line. This was my second Olympics, and, first, and I had been in one world championship. I had been racing internationally for five winters. We didn't make any money skiing. I had no money whatsoever. I had one year of college under my belt. Um, I was 21 years old. Um, I had, by then I was given equipment, but um, you know, I had one or two pairs of skis, and that was it. Uh, basically, I had not a penny in my pocket, and I was ready to stop. I wanted to move on. Penny, number one to start, sets a blistering pace. She's been a top contender for at least four years. When I was skiing the downhill, and I had number one, and I almost crashed on this airplane corner 38 years ago. Looks like she may be in trouble. I can remember very well thinking as I was about ready to fall on my face, Penny, if you fall here, you have another four years. And somehow, I, I got myself back up, got my balance back, and went through the finish line. And I, of course, got a silver medal. Vice President Nixon, he had been watching the Olympics, and he came down to me and he said, Miss Patu. I said, oh, Vice President Nixon. He said, I'm so happy to meet you today. And he shook my hand. And I want to tell you how sorry I am you lost today. I said, but, but I won a silver medal. But you have two more t chances to win for America. He turned on his heel and left. So I fixed him. I won another silver medal two days later. This is it. This is the ski happening. Go ahead. If you feel like yodeling, let it go. Ah, yes. Skiing's perpetual yodel. And having apparently made a successful transition to the American way of life, once again, here's Stein Erickson. With his movie idol looks and his famous flip, Stein was the Pied Piper of the 60s swinging ski style. There is a way a girl can determine if stretch pants fit right. If she has a dime in her hip pocket and she can decide whether it's heads or tails, then the fit is right. The difference between uh, now and the 60s, I think, was that uh, skiing was still very much on a high growth curve. And uh, there were many, many more skiers coming into the sport than were dropping out every year. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of innovation, both in teaching and in equipment. Those were the years when people would drive for hours to come to our housewife classes. I mean, they were $2 for a two-hour lesson. Um, I think it was $12 for, for eight lessons. As skiing became easier, its popularity soared. Metal skis, some called them cheaters, and safety bindings were followed by buckle boots that climbed higher and higher up the leg. Stretch pants tried to decide to be in or out. And in the midst of all this glamour, perhaps as a reaction to it, what should arise from the nearly dead but cross-country? Cross-country 
the whole emergence as a popular sport uh, started to occur in the, in the mid-60s and, and sort of spread out from the Putney School. Over Putney was a, was a hotbed of cross-country skiing and John Caldwell was, was a pioneer in that and then wrote a book, How to Cross-Country Ski, and the next thing we're all doing is um, sending off to uh, Eastern Mountain Sports for cross-country skis and there you go again. So it was, uh, we thought we were uh, doing something new. Uh, you know, the, the schools used to do that all the time. And the cross-country racers assumed that they were doing something new when they took to the highway for training purposes. Turns out someone had figured that out years ago. Well, sort of figured it out. What was new for the United States was international success in cross-country racing. In 1976, Bill Koch surprised the world with a silver medal in the Olympics and invented the skating technique, which is now used by every competitive racer. There was a boom in the mid-70s for Nordic skiing. I mean, it really was going well. Some of it had to do with our performance in the Olympics, and uh, some of it just had to do with the time. I was a ski bum, so I was deep into alpine skiing. And I was without a job and read an ad in the paper for a Nordic instructor at Mountain Meadows. And I called him up and I, he said, do you ski? I said, yes. He said, have you taught? I said, yes. So I went down for the interview and he hired me. And my first time on Nordic skis was in front of a beginner Nordic lesson. <laughs> so I fell in love with Nordic skiing through that experience. And then when I started to Nordic, I fell in love with the idea of putting on some skis and going out into the wilderness and having adventure. But because I had an alpine background, there was something missing. And that was that thrill of being able to control skis going downhill. Because in those days, Nordic skis were like arrows made of wood with no side cut. And the boots looked like a bowling, a rental bowling shoe from Astro Bowl. And I picked up an old ski book there was a picture of a of Telemark turn. It's a ski book from the late 30s. And I said, now there's an interesting looking turn. I've never seen that. And he has his heel up. So I went out and tried it. I got that swoop and I said, this is the missing link between Alpine and Nordic. Now I can go Nordic skiing and I can have a challenge on the downhills and control my skis. Golden Fleece is first tracks. I want first tracks. And people will get up and go up with the ski patrol and they'll sleep in their cars, you know. First tracks are important, fresh snow is important. Well, you can get first tracks and fresh snow every time you ski in the backcountry. The Adirondacks, the High Peaks region in New York, the Green Mountains, the Whites in New Hampshire, and then Katahdin is the other jewel in the necklace. That's what brought me to Katahdin. That's the jewel of Maine, that beautiful singular mountain range up there in northern Maine it's, that takes eight hours to drive to and then 14 hours to ski into to camp if you're going to go all the way up the chimney pond. Remember how it felt when you were in college and you were driving up to your favorite ski area on Friday night, and as soon as you were going up the access road and you came around, you saw the groomers and you had to pee? Remember that? It's like you got so psyched for skiing. And that night, and that morning you got up and it was like, heck with breakfast, you know, let's go. In my experience in Alpine, I started to lose that a little bit because I'd Alpine so long. And then I found it again in Telemark. was just going out when I started skiing. We used to laugh at telemarks and we used to do it all the time. 
we used to have a lot of fun doing it, but we thought it was just so old fashioned that it was laughable. And I think it's fun. I think people like doing anything that's a little different. And another thing, the boots are so comfortable comparatively. I think the boots are abominable now. By the time I started Burton, you know, as a snowboarding company, I had more or less lost uh, my passion for skiing. I think a lot of it had to do with where equipment had gone. It had gotten very rigid, uh, you know, plastic boots and, and real high boots and just a lot of support. And I learned to ski whenever in the early 60s and the boots were leather and soft. They had some flex to them and I really enjoyed that feel more and I think that had a lot to do with it. So when I started Burton, you know, my ideas were that not to pursue snowboarding as a skiery activity but more as a backcountry thing or, or even just like not necessarily a tiny sledding hill but bigger hills and and backcountry type stuff. And the first boards that uh, we ever made, one was called the backyard and one was called the back hill. So that was pretty much my intention. Early snowboarders work out a few kinks in the 1970s. It might have been a pretty subversive idea, but at the same time, it looks somehow familiar. Perhaps the racing outfit worn by gold medalist Peekaboo Street is a metaphor for the complexity of today's alpine skiing. And when traditional racers ski virtually identical lines through the course, their differences measured in thousands of a second, others are driven to compete in ways that allow more individual expression. We were just kind of this extreme, you know, skiing thing that they, I think they didn't think it was very technical. In 1992, freestyle was finally accepted as an Olympic event. I remember just getting so frustrated because I believe there's two forms of sports. I think there's, you know, the timed, um, and then there's, you know, just like figure skating, there's the artistic side. I found that just mogul skiing just really, you know, like, it, it psyched me up. The freedom of expression and, you know, I felt a fulfillment. I felt that this is, this is what I feel I can express myself or challenge myself. Donna Weinbrecht began competing in the moguls on Killington's Outer Limits Trail. Outer Limits, gosh. Well, it's a mogul person's uh, dream. Looking at it looks like a football field width and, and length <laughs> and it's you know wall-to-wall -wall moguls. People would just pump you up and uh, you know and it was just something that you want to keep improving and it was just a good atmosphere and a, to grow um, and to get better because everybody just was like air baby you know. <laughs> you know my whole career is either it made me or I tamed it. I don't know which one, okay. but probably both. Um, and they have a contest at the end of the year and it was huge and all year long, everybody would just be talking about the Bear Mountain Mobile Challenge at the end of the year. Everybody was training for the Bear Mountain Mobile Challenge. Rat feeling so much pressure, more than <laughs> probably, uh, well, probably comparable to the Olympic gold medal. Plus, I was just first starting competing, but uh, you know, everybody had bids on who was going to win that year, and that you would be the queen of, you know, Bear Mountain. So it's become quite a legend, and uh, a lot of great skiers, you know, spawn from there. But I knew sport was going into this more of a you know, kind of free ride expression. Um, you got you got your skateboarding, your rollerblading, you got your snowboarding. Um, just sport seems to be more extreme.
In the Northeast, when talk turns to extremes, it always comes back to Mount Washington and Tuckerman's Ravine. One man grew up with Tuckerman's as his backyard hill. When the snow is just exactly right and the conditions were right, I would seek out some untouched uh, areas. So in the years between the middle 40s and the early 50s, I uh, pioneered a, a 12 new routes up there. For example, he was the first to ski sluice, the first to ski icefall, and later turned his attention toward Hillman's Highway, where he became the first to ski what became known as Dodge's Drop. Dodge's Drop is, oh, maybe 20 feet wide. The whole section comes down in dog's legs. It's lined by rocks on both sides. So no matter where you fall, you'd hit rocks. Hey, it's a nice, steep, little, narrow place to ski. But then if you add what's underneath it, that's what's scary. You know, that's if you miss a turn, you could get hurt. So you don't fall. In fact, there are some of them up there I call no-fall gullies. That's one of them. I had an experience once there where I skied by some ice climbers. That was a little scary, because it was, pardon me, and they were climbing up and I was coming down. And then I realized, like, this is pushing it a little bit. Well, I think the reason that we're getting into extremes is not anything new at all. We all were trying to do something better or bigger than the other guy. The only difference is that, that doing anything really different or really better is getting to be next to impossible. Extreme skiers, last words. Hey dude, watch this. I'm sure that the, the greatest experiences that skiers have is in powder when you're by yourself and you're making the first tracks. But I like it on a blue slope that's beautifully groomed as well as being on something steep and deep. I sincerely like going up as much as coming down. And if you can keep a secret, probably more. Let everybody go wherever they want. I'd let people ride. I want to ride with the riders who are having the most fun, and they're the most enthusiastic. You could be the great international rider, but if you've just been doing too much of it or you're burned out on it or whatever, you know, it's just not going to be as much fun to ride with you as it is with somebody that's been riding for a year that just loves it and can't get enough of it. I understand what Jake's saying. Having it been in three Olympics now, I think it's getting intense. And that's why, to me, I know I want to step out. I want to go out, ski the bumps that I want to ski, and, and, uh, and have fun again. I think it's fun to be in on the beginning of anything. It doesn't matter much what it is. The early days are the real kick. What a snowboarder is looking for and what a skier is looking for are not super different in, in the essence of, of what they're doing. They're getting out in the middle of winter and riding on snow, having fun doing it. Snow has a way of soaking up human stress better than any medium I know. You cannot go for a ski in the woods stressed out and come back that same way. I don't know what, it's, what it is, but uh, when things are really rough, um, I, I need to be in the mountains. And uh, even when I'm happy, I want to be in the mountains. I just like that feeling. It feels clean, clear. Everything's cleared out. And I come back with a new perspective on life. You're communing with something, and you feel it because there's no other force around. You're also sharing the same experience that the person 100 years ago had. You're wet and you're cold and you're enjoying the sunshine and the snow and the ice and the gliding and the exertion and the sweating just like them. So you have this connection to them too.
Vermont PBS, partnering with local filmmakers to bring you stories made here. For more, visit vermontpbs.org.